everyone, what's going on? This is the Above Normal Podcast with Cappy Pondexter and Brown Sugar, <laughs> aka Shane Bamaway. What's up? And I'm Rob Fajardo. This is episode three of the Above Normal Podcast. You guys saw in our last episode that we had such an amazing conversation with Bianca. What an amazing person. And Shane is here on episode three with us. Shane, so appreciative to have you on. Pleasure, man. Honored to be here. For those who don't know who you are or your background or what you're up to, give us a high level of what you're doing, what your values are, nope. and why you're above normal. Man, all right. So born and raised in the Midwest, uh, came from Indiana. Uh, my parents came to this country from South America, kind of that $25 in a suitcase type of story. Mm. You know, told me I could have anything I wanted in this world, uh, as long as I had my education. Uh, so I did that. I studied hard. I went to Indiana University. Um, you know, studied one of those kids that like did like 20 plus credit hours a semester. I only realized that recently that that's not normal. Uh, <laughs> when I it up, because I work with a lot of students now. But um, yeah, found my way to Wall Street. Uh, started so I started out in finance, and I've been in that kind of that whole startup and emerging growth sector ever mm. since I started, right? So um, doing advisory work, private placements, then I was a venture capitalist for about uh, mm. five or six years, had a couple startups that I worked on, spin outs, uh, led an advisory practice, then I got to the point where I was like, man, we are really heading down some weird paths here. And I, I, just, I literally got sick of seeing the investment flowing to where it was, right? A lot of companies, and look, we're not that far away from Silicon Valley, but like the companies that are getting funded and what they really advance, I'm like, damn, imagine if we refocus these dollars and the stuff that actually meant something, mm -hmm. uh, because no one is taking into fact like what that social value is really worth, because it all does have an economic value associated with it, right? Mm -hmm. So I uh, started out with uh, Quaku Mandela, which was one of my, for the founding partners, uh, and then built this team around it, right? Who's Quaku just for? So this you know. woman, uh, Nelson Mandela's grandsons, um, and me, him, and this fellow Michael Orso, all started this group called Represent, which was this kind of uh, foundational approach to shifting culture. And then, you know, part of the strategy was to have kind of this nonprofit arm that was influenced by media, and then couple it with a for-profit arm that could actually create real businesses. So, um, started on that nonprofit piece first. Then I left to kind of do the for-profit piece, which we now call Carbon, right. um, which has a lot of different meanings, which I can go into later. But uh, Built the team around that, uh, ex, ex uh, operators from big companies like Cisco, Philips, uh, startup operators, uh, people doing regulatory work around the world, and created this small nucleus. And now we've grown this to probably about uh, 15 or 20 people or so that come from amazing backgrounds uh, that we're lighting up our portfolio and we're just in the process of getting it uh, rolled out. So thank you so much. We do. I appreciate you for coming on and you know making that transition you know from finance into impact and you know bridging those industries mm -hmm. you know a lot of all good deeds are very important right from holding a door or cleaning up trash or like giving somebody a compliment when you can really find ways to like empower people in their financial situation or like actually level them up yeah. you know then it's like you're not putting a band-aid on a situation you're really you know helping the situation inside yeah. out you know and, um, but, but that's exactly right, right? Because this, this, we're done with band-aids, man. Band-aids don't work. <laughs> band-aids are temporary. You know, I want reconstructive surgery, right? I want to fix the problem from the root. And like you said, a lot of it is economical. So teaching someone and showing them way to do business, we're all about redefining how capitalism is done, mm -hmm. right? Taking wealth creation, social prosperity, and environmental intelligence all equally weight. And if we can do that, that's how we can uplift communities from the grounds up, change the DNA, change the expectations for the way business is done, but also give them a means of how they can actually better their lives. Because we're all about you know teaching people how to fish, teaching how to bait with that fish, mm -hmm. and then ultimately create new fish one day, right? Mm -hmm. Through the power of technology and the shared economy. So you, so you guys are currently in Africa now, mm -hmm. doing work. So how, how is that process and how is everything going? Yeah, so we started out with, with 
three companies, and I'll, I'll quickly explain our model. So it's it's to take proven businesses that are already working, right? Mm -hmm. And they must advance our three pillars, and those are education, women's empowerment, and resource efficiency. So that's food, energy, and water. We're trying to say it in this camera so they can't catch it for you. Yep, so three pillars, education, women's empowerment, and resource efficiency, food, energy, and water. And the idea is to take these proven businesses and take them to areas with unnet demand. So essentially, from an entrepreneur standpoint, the reason why they would work with us is that we're actually helping them scale. Mm -hmm. We're actually giving them access to additional profits pools. and revenue, right. right? So we're taking their business, spreading it elsewhere. It's a co-opting approach, and we're empowering local entrepreneurs now to start that business for themselves. And that's how they can uplift these communities, because everything we work on fundamentally addresses the majority of the UN Sustainability Goals, uh, which is a set of goals that were started in 2016. There's 17 of them with the idea that these need to be achieved by 2030. 2030 is a tipping point for the world for a lot of reasons, both economically, environmentally, mm -hmm. um, education-wise. Like, There's a lot of different things going on. As we all know, the world's not right. that great. You're going to go to right utopia or dystopia. Right. And so you ask, like, how are we doing that? So taking those models, we, we found a company that we liked and engaged with in each one of those pillars. Uh, and what we're doing in Africa is really along the Clean Water for Africa lines. Uh, again, you know, even if trends currently continue now, globally, uh, most of the world is not going to be able to meet yearly water demand uh, on a year-round basis. Like, and then most people don't even know, but like, just take a quarter pound burger that you get at like Jack in the Box. Mm -hmm. That took over 450 gallons of water to produce. Wow. And none of that is priced into the, uh, the product, right? But then we go to areas like Asia, Africa, South America, Central America, where the water sources are contaminated and have a lot mm -hmm. of waterborne disease. Most people are dying from constant diarrhea, dehydration, um, and other diseases that they're contracting from the water, right? So these, this water filter called EcoFiltro is actually the business that we're spinning out and taking to those areas because one, it, about, it empowers local workforces. So it's actually made from the land, it's made from clay, um, and it's made by women oftentimes, and then it's also uh, made with using recycled plastics to make the housing. So we are holistically solving these problems and really it's a way of just you know combining and connecting the dots to show that this can be done but mm -hmm. it's something that people on our team have been doing for decades because you know either you want you have to just be aware that this is a possibility to do it um, but working with local uh, forces like the Africa Leadership Group, the Mandela Washington Fellows, care.org there's other groups that we've built around our ecosystem that's how we're creating these armies of people that want to do good and do well and do it now so what about Flint Michigan what, I mean what, do, what do we do what? <laughs> This is it's a, a good question, you know, because it's a great question. I don't, I don't know. Always we'll, looking yeah. to go out of the yes. country, and there's problems in our country. And I'll, too. and I'll tell you why I want to go out of the country. Because answer your question first. Yeah, yeah. So Flint, Michigan, can be solved any minute we choose to. Right. Mm -hmm. That is a, a a decision that was made on purpose because we choose to ignore that demographic. Hmm. Right. That is something that can be done like that if we really wanted to. From just the funding. And yeah. Oh yeah. Oh, ab absolutely. I mean, you know, let's be honest. If that happened in Malibu, you know how quickly that problem would be solved. That's just a good point. Right. That's the reality. I want to go where people actually want to be helped and and do better for themselves. Good question. Good. We don't want that here. Huh. That's our problem as Americans. Because our bureau bureaucracy. Yeah. Well, the people in absolutely. Flint want it, but they don't know how to lobby to get it into them. So. Right. That's right. We mm -hmm. could have access to those funds. That those problems could be fixed in not that long of time. I mean, right. If you look at how fast infrastructure is built, look at all these skyscrapers that go up. You know, if you really want to fix the water supply issue and do it in a healthy way, it can mm -hmm. be done in a very, very short period of time. It shows that people, you know, give uh, funding for different things because they strike a chord. Yeah. When uh, I, I uh, the the chat was it the chapel of Notre Dame? What was the big the big yeah, burning? Yeah. Notre Dame Cathedral. Yeah. Notre Dame Cathedral. Yeah. Like billions overnight, of dollars overnight. Six hundred billion. Found eight hundred. Right. Yeah. Something ridiculous overnight. And then um, I've been seeing a lot of parallels, obviously, because right now at the, this recording, you know, Australia's on fire. Yeah. Right. So yeah. that whole idea where it's like, you know, six hundred billion dollars were overnight for this yeah. building. But like relatively, the funding for this entire yeah. country being on fire is like nowhere near. Uh, an interesting stat I just learned: uh, just the amount of money and capital wasted from our fat diets that happen every j January when we decide we want to get in shape again mm -hmm. could feed the entire world. Do you know how, much, how much is it? I don't know the exact oh, really? number. I, I don't know the time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes. You but, that, but that's to show you the scale, just mm -hmm. as Americans that we we control. Mm -hmm. but the our reality is too is that even just from a diet standpoint, we're talking about that. Like you can't even sustain. 
what we're doing now because there's not enough land to create. Everyone's adopting our diet. Mm. So man, there's a lot of things like I, for me, life is all about balance, um, and and nature is too, right? But that's what we're we're hitting. Mm -hmm. We're hitting a, that we're disturbing that equilibrium, mm -hmm. and the world will fix itself. The the planet will actually heal itself. The problem is we're not going to like the results. So we're already seeing that with heat waves, mm -hmm. rising tides, floods, agricultural damage. It's to the point where, it, it, from a food security standpoint, our biggest challenge is going to be how we isolate the actual uh, environmental conditions, mm -hmm. which mm -hmm. you know we're not God. We don't have any control over that. Mm -hmm. So. Look, that's why sustainable farming is such a big deal because mm -hmm. you know the little the food food supply for the world depends on it. Mm -hmm. One thing that I like out of your three pillars was like women's empowerment and women's education. And mm -hmm. from speaking with you off camera and and, and some of your partners, yep. Almost in like in a, in an indirect way, it's like could women's empowerment solve the climate issue, right? Because my question is, one of the stats that you guys showed me or shared with me was the direct relationship between um, women's education and success mm -hmm. that when the women are, or when women are more empowered within a society mm -hmm. and can share ideas, make money, grow, then m monetary and non-monetary benefits are created. And as we all know, I think women influence everything, right? So yeah. this idea is like, as women just like grow and rise, I would imagine that that would kind of permeate itself over into all of these major decisions that you just listed, climate, like, and finance and economy and all these things. So my question comes from like, where did you, like, where did you guys learn those statistics? Or like, can you expound upon that like mathematical relationship between what happens when women in the community in Africa or anywhere? are educated, how does that overflow into the family? Mm -hmm. How does that overflow outside of the family and then into the economy? It's interesting, man. It's a deep question, right? Yeah. So there, there's a lot of layers there. But I mean, we, we were talking about this before, right? I think off camera is just like, you know, talking about like what the earnings are in the WMBA versus versus normal. But still, I think it's, it's 80 cents on the dollar in general, right? Uh, women compared to men, you know, that's the earnings that are, that are made, but it's even worse for women of color. And in some in some cultures, it's it's far worse, right? So, but the the reality is, you know, women kind of control the culture at the same time, and and it's been that responsibility just by the way nature is set up. Um, you know, just the ability to have children and and nurture inherently, you know, that's what's passed down, right? Mm -hmm. It actually becomes the women are the center of the household because they're what hold the family nucleus together. Right, right. They're the spawn of life at the same time. Um, it, it's sad that you know they're held back because their view is their either their work is not equal, um, their skill sets, what, whatever it might be. There's this massive inequality, right? But as a ground, it's just leverage. You know, I think it's yeah, yeah, you know, it's a it's a power thing too. And honestly, it happens to men of color too. Like I'll be honest with That's you. That's a good point. Um, I I relate to a lot of women issues when I hear things talked about because men look in the world in the world I grew up, man. Like first of all. There's greater odds of becoming a professional athlete than there is going into like venture capital. Hmm. But when I would be with my peers, I'm literally the only person of color right. uh, of my at least my skin tone right, right. Uh, in many rooms, and it's been like that through almost every job I've ever had. And hmm. my voice was never heard. Like right. honestly, like if or maybe you're the de facto color guy. Yeah, or what, whatever, whatever like, it might be, but I can tell you there's been a number of times, and you've probably faced this yourself, yeah. where you would say something straight up right away, and it wasn't listened to, and then now two or three hours go by, and somebody says, says the exact same thing. thing, and I'm like, wow, really? And it's like this guy was Neil Armstrong and playing the flag on the moon. It's like, yo, I said that three hours ago. Wow, we could have saved that much time. And honestly, to, to date, <laughs> for some of the things I've experienced, tens of million dollars that could have been saved and almost decades worth of time. Mm -hmm. But, you know, again, my voice was muted. But what does that mean? If people have an equal voice, uh, and I can kind of fast forward, I, you know, the, the actual statistics, it's, it's hard to say because it's so different from even community to community. Like what happens here sure. in LA versus New right. York versus right. yeah. my, my uh, hometown of Richmond, Indiana. In another country, right? It's, it's night and day, but at the end of the day, it's all about providing the right opportunity, the right playing field, giving people equal opportunity to excel. The reality is this is a very Darwinistic world, no matter what it is, right? Humans are no immune to that. 
If I give you a chance and you blow it, that's on you. I don't, I don't really care what, who you are, what you're made of, you know, what's your sex, it doesn't matter. We all have to choose to excel. We all have to like do our best. The strongest will survive. Yeah, absolutely. For but, those who know. don't know what Darwin, who Darwin is, Darwin just stated, you know, yeah. that, uh, yeah. 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 Share, share with them survival, with survival of the fittest, right? It happens in nature. Um, it, it creates this evolution that the, the most strongest traits follow through. Um, but women are inherently more advanced than men. Their entire bodies change when they're about to bear a child. Their senses increase. We, we don't do any of that. Um, if anything, we tune out faster than anything. <laughs> but, um, you know, we're, we just don't have that level of advancement. But what you actually see is like if you create that opportunity, households start to thrive. There's more wealth. There's more opportunity for the kids. Um, there's more balance. There might be less psychological tension, right? You know, we all need to find our peace and harmony, but that can happen from the very ground level up and start to swell. The community starts to be better. It's literally GDP production, and education is the number one key to unlocking GDP. What you'll mm -hmm. find is that for the smartest countries that have the best education, they literally have the highest GDP per capita, and the mm -hmm. reason is because of that intellect. Um, but what's interesting too is you. Is you Do you know what they're educated on? Because I like when. No, I'll tell you. Yeah, that, simple. Like, what is yeah. the education that you need? To it, well, one of it is as basic as just simple critical reasoning skills, right? The ability to kind of think on your feet and really solve problems, and it starts a lot of time with just math. Um, and then, of course, you have to layer literacy on top of that. But then, there's this whole other aspect of arts and culture and trade that creates. A whole new environment again it's different by by sections but right. if we fast forward through all that what you find in more egalitarian societies like what the danish have done that what, what's interesting is all people are given equal opportunity to excel right they're paid the same they can get the same jobs the same titles mm -hmm. interestingly enough what happens is that women end up being more feminine men end up being more masculine we all just revert back to nature Hmm. Which is, but which is, what would you expect? I would expect that. I wouldn't expect anything less. Hmm. Right. And why do you get? Why do you? Why do you? Because it's a circle of life. It's all interconnected, like one with sure. nature. Um, we all are part of it, and we all need right. each other to mm -hmm. kind of like. And we're beings, yeah, we right? Are. There's male and female, and there's different traits that are associated with that. Mm -hmm. Just like in every other animal or life form we know, mm -hmm. it's no different. It's no mm -hmm. different. I agree. So, on a lighter note, I, I realized and I've heard that you work with the Mandela family, correct? Mm -hmm. How how is it working with that family? Because I'm a, I'm a huge fan of, of Nelson Mandela. Nelson Mandela. Yeah. So. so Nelson Mandela is probably one of my uh, favorite figures in the history of the world, right? Um, it's a big family too. Don't get me wrong. Like, there's a lot that. of branches <laughs> on that tree. Um, you know, what's interesting is just how many things they're they're doing to make this world a better place like the different foundations they have the different um things they sit on like my partner for instance kweku you knows like i'm the board of global citizen he's doing out of africa um he's really focused on like how we build up the next generation of youth mm -hmm. and and identify young change makers and um you know that's just one window i have into that i can't speak for the rest of the family i know his brother is involved in doing a lot of things um inspiring entrepreneurs but you know at the end of the day it's uh it's one of the most powerful and i think um difficult legacies to live up to i mean it's 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 unheralded what has actually like what man can do and i mean that mm -hmm. man man is like a species men and women mm -hmm. you know if you have the discipline and decision to do something you can do it um you can also hold your values and and make sure that you don't compromise your integrity and that's just to show like what one person can do mm -hmm. uh, when, when they unleash themselves, right? Uh, but you know, it's, it's been great working with him. I mean, it's, uh, he's just so involved with so many things. And you know, this is the start to really building out communities from the ground level up. And that's what we're excited about. Mm -hmm. Another thing too, which I wanted to ask is, what has been one of your greatest learning lessons since really going underneath the hood of this social impact space, right? And now that you've put time, yeah. money, energy um, into this, you know, you've been on the yep. road, you guys are raising a, a $50 million fund or something around? Yeah, we're, we're structured as a holding company, but yeah, we are, we are so raising, raising, right? We're raising so, an, yeah. an amount of money, yeah. yep. larger, you know, not a, one million, but tens yep. of millions, right? You, you guys are in very important conversations, you guys are yep. 
not just talking about it, you're really on the path of doing it as well. Right. So what are some things that you're, you've learned now that you know, you're know you going underneath the hood and yeah. traveling around the world and yep. seeing these things in real life? Well, I mean, like, like anything else, when you really go under the hood, you really start seeing what's up, right? Um, what I am pleased to see is that this category of impact is receiving trillions of dollars of investment, right? True. Um, yeah. So it is getting the right attention. It is the thing. I, I think it is actually going to be a standard way of which of how business gets done, and, and it should be, quite honestly. Um, the frustrating part is like I've been involved with this space for twenty some twenty years now, right? Mm -hmm. And the reality is like we needed to start this a long time ago. Mm -hmm. um, you know the saturation points that we're reaching. I fully don't believe we can't unwind what has been done. I don't think we can step backward. Uh, for what's being done with emissions and things like that. We're just gonna have to deal with the impact that we're gonna face from it. But um, I also am pleased to see so many different models evolving. Um, I still think there's a lot of um, philanthropy out there mm -hmm. uh, and a lot of mechanisms that don't self-sustain. And, and again, that's where we took a different approach. We, we engineered carbon to be what it is because we want to maximize wealth creation for, for everyone throughout the entire stakeholder chain, right? Mm -hmm. From and investors to just local gives. entrepreneurs. Yeah, and what it gives back to the economy, because again, this holistic thinking, it, it, it really unleashes something unparalleled, right? And it, and it is that. And it's you know, coupling that with influencers and, and stakeholders from students, like really work with you know 20 some students you know, in the summertime and year round, but it's giving them access to skill sets they'd never had before. It's getting them their dream jobs because it gives them a different story, but also a skill set that they can take. And hopefully as they become senior and managers somewhere that they can instill some of these disciplines. Um, but, you know, some of the shocking things are is like, you know, certain things just don't work. And mm -hmm. there's still a lot of fraud and I would say phoniness, uh, just like anything else, right? There's window dressing involved, like, oh, hey, yeah, I'm part of this too, but the transparency isn't always there. Mm -hmm. The defined metrics and, and things that actually illustrate like what is actually being done, what are the key performance indicators? So things that can actually be validated and verified, um, that's, that's sometimes lost in the shuffle. I mm -hmm. think that needs mm -hmm. to rise more to the top. Um, but I don't think there's been too many things as well that really look at community and household levels and starting with that. Like sometimes mm -hmm. there's too much of a zoomed out approach or a higher level approach taken. And I, in the long run, I don't think that has its maximum effectiveness. That's, mm -hmm. that's just my opinion. So so do you guys think that we ha we're on the verge of having 10 years left to exist on this earth? Not to exist, no, no, and I, and I say this, but I do think that there are gonna be extremes, especially with weather, like take what we saw last year, man. Like I mean, people don't really realize what what happened. And if you remember this polar vortex that hit around this time last year, up in Minnesota and Chicago, that we had negative 75 degree, negative 80 degree temperatures, right? Well, I, I kind of read into it and tried to understand what actually caused this. So there was a 125 degree temperature spike basically all the way up in the Arctic, right? And it created this surge of warm air that then broke this um, this cold air down, right? But if you ever seen like the day after tomorrow, you know when they like step outside and they, mm. their like eyelids could freeze and all that stuff? That, that's literally like what happened. Like this thing spun down record quick. But um, what was interesting is when that warm air broke off up there, it actually created seismic shock. And, and from what I read about is that if this keeps happening, you know, it can cause these mass earthquakes and tsunamis like on both sides of the ocean. Mm. And so you get these mass fixes, you're shifting tectonic plates. But that's to tell you how real this is. But like I said, look, the Earth will find its way to heal itself, yeah, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. The question is, can we heal can ourselves? Can we heal ourselves? The Earth has no problem Yo, that, and that's, staying alive. Again, that's how Are we going to become extinct. Um, I don't think You're we're right. going to die, but I do think there's going to be heavy losses of life. But there's going to be heavy losses of real estate. The biggest losses are actually going to be in the educational wealth gap that is already bad today. So think about it, like where I come from in Indiana, maybe where you grew up, uh, you, went, you, you were from Chicago for a bit. A lot of people can't afford to replace their water heater if it goes down right now, right? That might be six, seven, eight hundred dollars. They just don't have that money. What do you think happens when their whole house and life is devastated by yeah, a flood death, yeah. or freeze something? Whatever it is, their entire life as they know it is gone and they're getting paid 60 cents on the dollar for insurance. Right. You're done. You're, that whole next generation is done. done. You yeah. can't recoup. You, they don't have the education.
to pull back up. Mm -hmm. Like it's a so serious, the ribs serious get issue. richer and then the pull. Oh yeah, yeah. And I, so I really appreciate you you sharing that that perspective side of it too because it goes into what I was going to share of a more fuller version of philanthropy, right? Mm -hmm. Where your version isn't just giving, it's it's empowering. Yep. Right. So the best philanthropy, in your opinion, is yes, here's some funds to do something, but by also giving the skills, the knowledge, the resources mm -hmm. of the community, it's the same as like not giving a man a fish, but teaching a man a fish. Yeah, it's because that. in that situation, your own critical thinking skills and your yep. own education are the only things that could allow you to innovate to survive in that tough situation where right. your water heater goes out, you don't have enough money, that takes right. a, bit, a lot of critical thinking skills, you know, to right. to not get pulled back, you know, so. Yeah, we want to fix problems at the root, right? And to me, important. instead of philanthropy, what we're trying to create and provide is opportunity, right? And honestly, I think that's what my life's purpose has been. Hmm. And, you know, trying to help develop this model and come up with what we've done, it's literally to provide opportunity to everyone. It's for working professionals that might have idle time, capital, skill sets they can lend. So the way our whole carbon copy uh, model is like as we take businesses to other areas, it's like, hey, you as a law firm or you as an accounting firm or you as you know whatever we work mm -hmm. in our daily lives, look, I wanna invite you to rather than be volunteers, I want you to be shareholders in this. Mm -hmm. I want you to allow your employees to work on these projects and have economical wealth that's created from it. Because now that you are tied into it, you're gonna, you can actually put your heart and soul into it. And, and, and as a result, we start to uh, solve this problem of people not having purpose through their everyday jobs, which is one of the main reasons for job turnover too, and people leaving. So I don't know if you know the stat, but about 70% of people are dissatisfied with their jobs. Right, yeah. Right, so, and a lot of it's because they, they lack purpose. So imagine if your company can actually help provide something that either you guys vote on as an institution, say, hey, we want to put an end to this problem in the world. I want to dedicate my time and resources and capital or whatever part of me I want to put into it, and we can do this together as a company, right? And that's what Carbon is for. They can join us in all this. And the same thing with students too, right? We want them to come on board. We want everyone in this ecosystem to band together, use the shared economy uh, to its fullest, because that's how we can mm -hmm. tackle these problems and do it fast. So do you think that financial uh, financial uh, what do you call it um, I can't literacy think. yeah do you think it's important that it goes back into the high schools to teach it again to oh to absolutely educate? no it's probably one of the number one gaps right and I bet you as an athlete know this more than anyone because I can't tell you how many professional athletes I, I talk to and it's like anything else look the first time I got a car loan I didn't realize I was getting raped until after I got raped, right? And then the next time you learn. But like, those are the things that I mean that you overpaid. To be, mean, mean yeah, look, or paid. either I overpaid. Why? Because I was, bad. well, the loan's bad, right? So they, they jacked the finance rate up. Just They're, for people that don't know. Right. Somebody will be like, oh right. shit, well, well, what makes a bad break, loan? Let me just yeah. break down what yeah. a bad loan is, right? One, you, you, your rate is way too high. It's not at market what it should be. Um, they tell you your score is this. Oh, because your credit score is that, you know, the reality is the dealers are tacking on extra basis points or even percentages to that interest rate in addition to what the bank is doing, mm -hmm. right? So now there's like this other incentive. Um, they, they upcharge you for, oh yeah, you need your VIN number scratched in the window or let's do this nice paint treatment, all that stuff. You don't need any of that crap. <laughs> um, and then, you know, oh, well, what's the monthly payment you're trying to shoot for? All right, yeah, I want to shoot for, I don't know, $800 a month, right? Mm -hmm. um, oh, cool, we can get you there. Let's give you a 96-month loan, right? And it's like, wow, if you pencil that out, you end up paying, you know, probably at least 20, 30% more for that car versus mm -hmm. doing a regular year uh, loan of like three, four, five years, right? Mm -hmm. There's levers that are played with, but you don't know this until you get screwed. Mm -hmm. But these are the type of things, like even just buying a house, even how to balance check, what the ins and outs of how to use credit cards properly, right? Mm -hmm. That's the stuff that needs to be taught in schools. And the same At thing, what age you how to manage money. High, high school at least? Yeah. Do you think high school or even middle school? What do you think? I, I think, think middle grade? schoolers are smart enough. Now I start with like eighth grade. Like, cause yeah. you know, you start to do high school jobs. You know, there's this whole concept of like saving, right? Yeah, like, eighth grade, you're definitely like thinking no, how to get no, some money. Because, like, you know? people start doing whatever. Grade, right. yeah. So this whole concept of how you create a balanced, um, excuse me, a wealth portfolio as a ninth grader, 
It's like, I should be setting a certain number aside to create this cushion. Mm -hmm. The rest is like my disposal income. Mm -hmm. This is for stuff I want to buy, whatever. Teach budgeting. Right. The reality is life is about budgeting right. and every I'm aspect. still learning. Even with, time, <laughs> even with time too, right? It's time and capital. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. that there's a huge gap there. Oh, yeah. And but that's again that's part of like why we're to, businesses we are trying to bring are fiscally sound right if you look at like what's going on in Silicon Valley a lot of these big unicorns I keep reading of hundreds of layoffs every day because mm -hmm. they haven't fundamentally found a business model that's profitable mm -hmm. literally business 101 right, right you true. learn this in high school right, right. but no let's do this giant land grab let's let's true. let's pump this with capital but all you're doing is also pumping it with uh, inefficiencies and whatever is wrong is going to be amplified mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. right so true. that's that's the problem but you know if you have a good business and you pump it with capital you can actually do a lot of good things. Mm -hmm. I know we got like five minutes or so sure. left for any you know high level but really impactful questions. Do you have any questions off the top or I definitely Drop it on me. Give I me think, some shit. Come on. I think that's <laughs> pretty much everything that I really wanted to know about okay. what you do and your experience. But I, I'm thankful that because you, you taught me a lot today. And really? I think what are yeah. some things that you like? That'd be a good takeaways. You know, uh, just some the, the carbon model um i learned a lot about that because i didn't know that programs actually like that existed mm -hmm. around the world or people were interested in doing things like that so for me to learn about it uh now i can study more about it sure. and know you know when i'm watching my shows or whatever like okay now i understand <laughs> what brown shit was talking about hell yeah i love that a, a, a nice question that uh, I like to ask, I, I'd asked Bianca in the last episode that you guys saw, was um, you're given a golden microphone, right? And um, whatever you say in this golden microphone, everyone in the world um, mm -hmm. will hear it. All the decision makers, all the common people, all the people in between, people that are gendered, non-gendered, right? Every single living being will hear this message and um, it has the ability to make some real influence. So if you were to you know close your eyes and put yourself into that moment, you take three or four steps yeah, on the that's podium. Deep. It's all yours. It's, above, you got, it's, you above, it's above normal podcast, brother. You're leaving normal us. behind. Um, hi. Huh, it's simple because it's the way I live my life, and it's not a quarter mile at a time, kind of, but not. <laughs> but I would say, the number one thing I would say is, create the moments that you want to have flash before your eyes before you die. That's beautiful. That's dope. That's really beautiful. That's, I like that a lot. Seek those opportunities every year. I actually kind of try to put an artificial timeline on my life to force myself to live, to go see this world, mm. to go experience as many people. Um, because look, I, you know, I think on the last episode you talked about like, hey, let's surround people just like us. Mm -hmm. I kind of take more of an opposite approach. I want to hang out with the people I would never hang out with, with the people I could never possibly hang out with, hmm. because I believe life is all about creating reference points, right? You can't appreciate the light unless you know the dark. Mm -hmm. And that's where you kind of get your definition of self and know where you really sit. Because hmm. I got a lot of opinions on everything just because I take the time to like, you know, think about it. I, I try to surround yourself, yeah. myself with other people with different opinions too and have different perspectives. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I would say create those moments because I think us as a culture, I think we work too hard, honestly. I think people need to go travel more. I think the European model is far more advanced. I think people would have less stress, more balanced lives, healthier lifestyles, and just enjoy your time here because look, we're all in line, well, in line to, to be taken one day. Sure. That's the only guarantee. And the minute you realize that you basically have no control what happens between now and then mm -hmm. is when you've elevated your thinking. Because I can tell you this, like I can, I can destroy anything by my actions. Mm -hmm. What I can't always do is build things up. Mm -hmm. I can try and do my best, but I, my free will gives me the power to tear down any relationship I've created, right? Mm -hmm. And I can do that. Because that's what action can do, but that's what free will is. It's, it's, it's a blessing and a curse at the same time. That duality, right? To break right. something down or to build something up. But aligning the stars, I can't always control and influence. I can do my best part. Right. I can do my thing to influence you guys. Mm -hmm. Ultimately, it's up to, to everyone else to say, yeah, I see the same vision. I see what you're mm -hmm. thinking. Mm -hmm. 
and it creates that opportunity to right? have some measurable difference. Right. And I think the final final question for me, and then Kevin, if you have one too, but I would love to know what do the words "leave normal behind" mean to you? Yeah, I, I live my life by that because I have never fit in. I'm a brown sheep. I'm not a black sheep. I was a real white sheep. No one knew what the hell I was. But I felt like let me let me just give you an example. You just take the shit on my wrist, right? And and my my. Fingers, I like right? it, dude. I love it, you guys. But I, I've worn this. Wall Street, Gonzo, yeah, Bobby, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but but I've literally right. So I've literally I have mixed kind of personalities and like uh, pieces of me, right? So it's not uncommon to see me riding down with the in a giant chopper down to Wall Street or mm-hmm. on a suit. Mm-hmm. I used to do that all the time, but like it was like my two worlds kind of colliding. Mm-hmm. I'm tatted up, right? right but right, nobody yeah. would ever know that. Yeah, and you, you know, I, yeah, I would walk in the meetings with all suits and people are like looking at my fingers and all my skulls and like, yeah, like stuff like this, like, you know. Right, right. Yeah, like, but that's just who I am. It's, mm-hmm. it, to me, it's just what I enjoy. It's, it's what I do, right, yeah. but uh, I don't know, I never wanted to, you know, we all wanted to fit in in some way, but then like when you really study like want, for what purpose, like just mm-hmm. do yourself, be you, you know, and now's the time to do that more than ever. You're right, it Love is that. 2020 vision. Hell yeah, 2020 right. beyond we get it. But you only get that vision with hindsight. Right. It's a good point. Yep. And then use the frameworks and the community to go forward. Right. Yeah. And now I'm focused on 2030 vision. That's where we're going. <laughs> so guys, thank you so much. If you haven't joined the Leave Normal Behind movement yet, look at the people we have in it, guys. It's amazing. If you're leaving normal behind, if you're above normal, go to the website, become a member. Shane, where can people find you sure. um, to connect with you? So my Instagram is just my last name, Vera Male, V-E-R-A-M-A-L-L-A-Y. Our website for carbon is carbongroup.global. And you know, that's just where we live. Amazing. Thank you. And we'll see you guys in episode four of the Above Normal Podcast. Peace. Help.